Hey, it's Harmony. I'm really stoked to release this update for Tiny Crate. I've been working on this for four months. So much has gone into this from all different directions. There's a character creator, online leaderboards with speedrunning stats. There's speedrunning ghosts so you can see your replay. There's 10 new maps going on and every world has a new color palette to be distinct and unique. There's a lot of crate variety and colors now. Instead of just one pattern with the X, there's gonna be two different palettes inverted from one another and a few different styles that'll swap between and even flip on the x-axis the pause menu has been totally rebuilt there's some stats in the corner for when you're replaying a level rebindable controls means any keyboard key or gamepad input can be customized to whatever you like i've heard people with different keyboards than the qwerty having trouble with the x and c are so close on qwerty and if you have a different layout it's not gonna help you so you can choose whatever key you like and play the game however you so please. Oh my god. All right, the beans are done and I'm back with a double chocolate chip cookie. Gloom free, baby. Let me just eat this for a second. <laughs> This feature is really exciting for me. I improved the touch controls for any device. It could be an Android phone, or if you had a Windows or Linux computer with a touch screen and it supports that. I made this little virtual joystick here so you can go up, down, left, right, do all that. And when you're in a level, it acts pretty well to get you around the stage. And it's much easier than the previous solution I had, like a left and right button, two different buttons. And I tried to make those left and right buttons work for every menu, and there was a lot of sketchy workarounds. Now you can navigate the menu the same way you do on your desktop or any version of the game because it's the same inputs, up, down, left, right, X, and C, all that on your phone. <laughs> Very stoked to finally do this. <coughs> Excuse me. These uh, cookies get into me. The start menu has been totally redesigned. I made some new icons and I picked out some new fonts for the title menu here. And the credits menu is integrated right here into the title screen. I just press back and I'm right here. I can press the options menu. It's also integrated into the title screen. It's something I did in Rota, my other game. Check that out. Uh, going through the options menu is pretty similar, although I was talking about the rebindable controls are right there. So looking at the save slots, three save slots will be shown on this menu. If you don't have any notes, they won't be displayed yet. It's kind of a secret, so I might as well keep it a secret until you find out about it. Uh, 37 gems and 37 notes. This is a maxed out slot right here. There's 36 gems in the whole game. The final one is secret, including the final note, so I'll let you guys find that out. Talking about these different color palettes for every world here, the classic color palette remains, and these boxes are a little snazzed up. Going back to the map, there is a different palette when it comes to the spikes. A little bit of a red hue. Going back to the map, Third world is gray a bit as well, although it focuses more on purple tones. Let's see, this stage shows it off a lot better. And looking back at the fourth world, much more green and red as well. And the final world of five. A lot of green going on here. <laughs> All right, so coming back to the character creator, kind of randomize the palette and randomize your name choose some little silly things picking out an outfit here take another bite of this double chocolate chip gluten-free vegan cookie kick it all right guys here we are at the character creator screen in the code in the editor in godot engine right now you can see it's separated into the actual world going on and the user interface side of it they're a bit split like the red sea you know <laughs> so jumping right into the code here it is a custom menu the other menus in my game all inherit from the same base class 
menu.gd although the creator is its own thing so this menu has two columns or what you know two axes so while we're navigating up and down through the menu of course that's changing our y value and hitting left and right on these colors actually keeps the x value the same it's shuffling through the values of those colors the x value comes into play right here when we're moving around on the keyboard and anytime that you go up or down between these, you're gonna go back to the fifth row. So even if I go back to accept, I'll go back to B. If I go up here, I'll go to number five. So kind of keeps it centered. Changing the color in the menu here is modifying a shader that does a palette swap on the player. Looking at the palette swap shader for the player, there is a color defined for each piece of the outfit and a swap defined for each piece of that outfit. If the color is equal, swap it out. It's as simple as that. There's a few different parameters going on here. We can even modify this in the editor if we change the skin color around like that. And whenever we're updating this palette right here, when we exit the menu, it's going to be saved onto our shared node under the player colors array which is a simple array containing four integer values that the player script reads when loading into the map using this static function set palette i made it static so anyone can call this function regardless of being the player gd script if i needed to call this from an auto load singleton or a different thing and convert the value much like i'm doing in the creator here i had a lot of fun with this character creator menu I defined a lot of silly names you can use. I made this function in the shared node generate username. It picks from all these different prefixes. Create box, block, square, rect, pack, cube, stack, throw, jump, jump and climb, thinky, brain, spike, skull, pixel, puzzle, pico. It picks a middle, which could be a space, an underscore, a dash, or a period. And it picks a suffix, which is kid, dude, dude, with two O's, pal, friend, bud, buddy, guy, gal, boy, girl, homie, person, human, robot, cyborg, man, woman, cousin, cuz, head, face, butt, fart, arms, leg, body, hands, feet, mind. And it picks any of those, it combines them together using that middle as a bridge between the prefix happens, a random middle piece is selected, the suffix happens, another random middle piece is selected along with a two digit number slapped on the end there. It could be a one digit number, it's just anything between zero and 99. I honestly have a lot of fun just spamming this random button and seeing wrecked butt 80 or stack butt 93, two butts in a row. If I use the keyboard key down here or an input on this gamepad, it's gonna reflect on the UI, showing different inputs based on what device you're using. Oh my gosh, the online leaderboards are so fun. I've been having a blast just loading up and seeing who has the high score on each level. I still got first place on 1-1, I don't know, let's see, maybe you can beat me. On the next world, dude, Got Sushi, Cyan, Origin, and Sky in the top four. Press start again to see who has the fastest note for this level. The fastest note collected on 1-3 is 10.71 seconds by Buddy Holly. Let's see if we can do better than that. All right. I'm trying to talk while doing this and it makes it so challenging. So I'm going to focus on this high score. Oh my gosh. Can we beat Buddy Holly's record, guys? Can we do it? Let's see what we got. 12.88, oh wait, no, 12, yeah. Dude, how did this guy get a 10.71? I don't know, <laughs> that blows my mind. All right, I tried my best. Buddy Holly's got a great score on 1-3 and we're gonna leave it too. <laughs> this really makes me wanna implement the sharing of replays so I can see how people beat this stage so fast. Like, what do they even do? <laughs> the replays are another system I'm totally stoked on. Going ahead and completing this level right there adds our own replay score. And starting a stage with the high scores selected will show the fastest replays you have for that category. Uh, I don't have any notes for this category, so it's not gonna show anything when I select that. You can also change which ghosts are showing from the pause menu. So if we go back to the run, we're gonna see those ghosts from the previous. And let's go ahead and collect the note on this stage so we can see what it looks like to record our own replay. And we start from the note here. And that was our last run right there, hopping around dawdling on the middle platform for a bit before walking outside of the stage and collecting that note. Let's go ahead and add another little replay here. And now we can even start the stage normally. There's no ghosts. You go and turn them on. 
the remote setting, we can see the two we just recorded. I'm always trying to connect players and having these online leaderboards is really fun. You can see other people playing the game in real time. If someone has a new score, the leaderboards are updated immediately. So for example, I really want to try to beat some of these scores. I know these players are doing really well, so it's going to be hard to do on camera right now. Go join the Discord in the description and talk about your favorite strategies for speedrunning some of these maps. I implemented these high scores using Silent Wolf, which is a free service for Godot Engine to incorporate high scores and different online data in your game. You can even have saved data between a user account on one device to another with this website and their services. This is the first leaderboard. It is just everyone who logs into the game and what their name is <laughs> and how many times they've logged in. The second one is showing uh, the 1-1 one and the scores stored here are in negative values. I use an integer for every frame of the replay. The score of negative 91 on the leaderboard shows as 1.51 in the game. One and a half seconds of real time. Only the top 10 scores are shown in the game, although a few more are shown here on the website. I also have a high score showing how many times players have died on each level. Oh my gosh, dude. It looks like 2-3 has the most deaths right now at 28,461 player deaths on 2-3. Followed by 2-4 with 22,958 collective deaths from players around the world on this level. Huh, that's wild, dude. Dude, the player Origin, apparently, has died 12,516 times. Just this one player named Origin has died 12,516 times. I commend you, Origin. I don't know how you do it. Looking at the code for the leaderboards here is leaderboard.gd. It's an autoload singleton in the project. It has a uh, obfuscated API key. I'm trying to get that to work. Last time I had to build the game using the raw string in there. So I want to at least hold on to the API key. <laughs> it's a very simple script here. It'll refresh the scores, refresh a single score, or submit a score from whatever you've just done. And this is interacted with the select scene. The select scene is of course the level select scene containing every little screen for each map that you can go to or the map screen as it's called in the game. <laughs> oh my gosh. Looking at the code for the map screen, the scene starts with one viewport and it's duplicated however many times it needs to be to fill out the rows and columns. And when you go up, down, left, and right, it's really just keeping track of a single integer value. The map vector dictionary actually references these values by the X and Y or the integer value. So you can feed in a vector two value and receive the integer back and vice versa to convert between the two positions. It might be overcomplicated, although it seemed to be the simplest solution for me at the time. When you press start, it'll hide the display for the map and instead show the high score, which is one static element that will move around with the camera and be refreshed based on whichever map you're currently looking at. So it refreshes the 3-5 or 3-4 here, and if I press start again, it'll refresh to be the note category and pull those high scores. If you look for the first split second, you can see it loading dot 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 before it fills in the details. All these scores are updated in real time, so scrolling over and whenever you see the loading icon, you know you're getting a fresh set of scores right there. The only time it'll reuse the scores is if you've already loaded them in the last 30 seconds. All right, I've added a character creator. I've added online leaderboards and speed running, and I've changed the color palette for each world here. In addition to that, I added 10 more maps. So the game used to go up to 4-3 right here, and this was the final challenge of the game. I then added all the way up to 5-4, which is now the new final challenge of the game. Technically speaking, you know, if you do win the game here, you'll see your time. You'll see uh, 37 gems. It's been 13 minutes and 17 seconds cumulative time. Same with the notes. I have 102% completion because 100% completion involves 36 gems and 36 notes. This stage has a hidden gem, a hidden portal to exit through, and a hidden note to collect. So. 
I'll let you find that out. I made this little crate spawner for fun on this map. So you can kind of mess around and have way more crates than any other map in the game and see what's possible like pushing around a giant stack of a million things. Watching them all fall down. Seeing 10 different things shake at once. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fun. And of these 10 maps, they introduce a new technique to progress the levels. Uh, when you come to this stage, many players get confused, or so I've read in the comments. Because you want to get over there, and you want to have this box with you. How do you do that? Well, spoiler, you can jump on top of the box and pick it up at the same time. You can get around. A lot further than you thought. Mm. <laughs> so there's 10 new maps. There's a unique color palette for each of these five worlds. And in addition to that visual variety, the crates now have unique visual variety. There's four crates here. So going to a stage with many, many crates, we can see the variety going on here. All right, look at those crates. There's a bunch of crates in a stack and they all look a little different. Some of them look similar. You know, you refresh it again, you might get some different ones. And uh, I wanted to, there to be some kind of variety going on. So you weren't just staring at the same image all day. I definitely enjoy the look of the game now, having this crate variety. I got so tired looking at the same dang box. The simple thing makes my brain happy. <laughs> this is the sprite sheet used for the boxes and it selects one of these images at runtime. It'll flip the X axis or keep it the same based on a random value same way it picks a random value for each of those frames and it will randomly choose between the default color palette or an inversion of that there is a value right here called flip which goes from zero to one and that's all i modify it's pretty simple and it works <laughs> but from the options menu you can see the keyboard or the gamepad setup even though i'm navigating with the gamepad i'm going to go ahead and open the keyboard setup here and when I resume using my keyboard, it's going to update the inputs accordingly. Changing the menu yes from K, space, and X, let's add O to that. And now you can see O is the new selection for our pick key. And if I press K, it's going to put K back to the front. That will be selected. If you press X again, it'll shuffle these things around based on the last thing you pressed. And we can go ahead and reset to defaults that the no key let's go ahead and start backspace you can't use the delete key because that's the clear key so if any of these keys are bothering you, you just get rid of them hit delete and then add another keys on top <laughs> if you try to delete your interface keys you can only have one left one remaining so you can always navigate your menu that's something I was inspired by Celeste from I looked at their remap menu and they have a similar thing where the UI inputs must always have at least one key so you can still navigate the game. There is not mouse support, so <laughs> keys have to get you by. You can of course change the unbind key to something else like page up. And now if I want to clear this key, I can hit page up and now it's at where it was. If I'm trying to press a new key and I want to exit, I can hit page up and resume editing other keys. So let's make a wild looking arrow keys in the corner there. Let's do shift. Let's make down page up. Let's make left enter. And let's make right to pause. Oh wait, there it goes. <laughs> so looking at the gamepad setup, oh, you'll notice left and right is only on the D-pad at the moment. That is due to an issue with Godot 3.5 having trouble with the joystick dead zone, it's a pain in the ass, and for the moment, if you want to rebind the stick, I, I don't know, just take the D-pad off and use the stick, or one or the other, because it'll overlap the inputs, and I haven't really figured that out. It's something I believe has been addressed in the 4.x branch, and it has yet to be backported to the 3x branch, so uh, stay tuned, I hope, you know? We'll figure it out together. So. Changing any of these keys, of course, will show up on those arrow keys down there. Just like when we're navigating the menu with the keyboard. Reset those to default. If we change the yes value to RT or RB, whatever. 
Let me change the no value. That gets updated. Any input that's on a gamepad should be supported, hopefully, and any input that's on an Xbox One or Xbox 360 controller has been tested to work as far as I've done. So the pause menu has been redesigned to include these replay ghosts, the ability to go to the options menu, and the stats in the left corner. Let's go ahead and look at the code for the pause menu. As you can see, it extends menu, which is our shared menu class to navigate the game. I designed the menu class to be easily modifiable to work with different setups. And looking at the script variables here, you can change the parent path, the list path, all that stuff will select those paths and create a node at the start of the script. So this way you can slap the script on a node in a different scene and you can set up the connections to all the nodes. And if you don't even set up a connection, it'll just opt out of using that. So right now the scroll path has not been assigned. This menu doesn't scroll. If we look at the key menu, we can see the scroll path has been defined because that menu does scroll up and down. It's as simple as that to modify and suit the needs of different menus with this script. There's all these little parameters to show what keys are available to press while you're on that menu like and where the keys are on the screen. So the UI expand is deciding whether the keys are going to be together in the corner or if they expand and fill up the whole screen. I made some overridable functions like menu input and menu underscore process. Where is that? And they are pulled into the physics process and input respectively. Making these sub functions allows me to override the physics process of the script and still have the original physics process pulling that menu underscore process. The menu is pretty chill for the script. If you press yes, no, press up, down, left, or right, it'll call these different functions that can be overwritten. It's really simple for me to plug in these functions on the child class. I don't have to deal with any input. I write the function for the input itself. Now we're looking at the touchscreen scene right here with the virtual joystick in the bottom left corner and these buttons over here on the right and top. So I've got my phone here with the virtual joystick on it and it works great on my device, which is a Samsung Galaxy something. Although my friend who has a flip phone that folds in half, I played it, we were playing on his phone the other day and the joystick was totally busted. You would let go of it like this and it would keep moving. So I'm not exactly sure what happened there. This is the only device, Android device, that I've tested this touchscreen on. I have used the mouse on the computer as well. So if anybody has strange issues with this touchscreen, please let me know. And I'm going to hope to improve this virtual joystick. Originally, I was looking on the Godot Engine asset library for a virtual joystick to meet my needs for this project. And I found this tool, Virtual Joystick for Godot 4. And I'm like, wow, well, I'm using 3.5. I wish I could use this project. And I looked at the files on GitHub, looked at the branch here, and I saw there was an old branch for the version 3 which is for 3.5 and I downloaded this repository. I started using it, although it didn't meet my needs. It did inspire me to build this joystick.gd script. Uh, it helped me realize about the touch index. So multi-touch events help and work properly. You can start moving your character in one direction and also jump and it will receive all of those inputs together. Any press inside of the joystick, you can hold on to it even outside of the surface. Of course, if you touched over here, it wouldn't start the joystick. Makes it easier to drag your finger around and get sloppy with it and let it happen. So looking at the code here, there's an input event and that's about it. There's no physics process event occurring. I could delete that, honestly. This script looks for a input event screen touch or an input event screen drag. And that is with touch screen devices. You're either touching it or dragging it around and those are received as separate inputs. So if the touch has occurred and it's inside the screen, start the process. If it's released, end the process of the interaction there. I take the angle of your finger from the center of the joystick in degrees and I divide it by 90 degrees for each quadrant and see which quadrant you're currently in and that's the direction that's going to be pressed. 
It will send an input with the send input function using input event action dot new. It's going to say the action has been pressed. It's going to specify which action and it's going to send it to be parsed by the game. Looking at the 3.5 docs for Godot right here, we have the method action press, which the previous script I was looking at used and it wasn't actually passing this action to the input functions of the game. This one will simulate pressing the specified action, but it doesn't actually cause any node input calls. It is intended to be used with is action pressed and is action just pressed. If you want to simulate underscore input, use parse input event instead. So that's what I'm using here for when I'm sending that one of four directions. It'll parse that one of four inputs and the other three are going to be released right above it here. So if the value does not equal the current direction, go ahead and release that value. And then the value that is the current direction is going to be sent and parsed as an input event. <laughs> of course, action up, down, left, and right can all be specified by whatever string value you like. So the inputs for the menus and the inputs for the game are two different input events in the Godot engine. If you look here on the input map, I'm using UI left, UI right, all those default things, as well as UI yes and no, which I've defined. And those are separate from just up, down, left, right, jump, action, which are the game commands. And when you load into the game, or even just pausing the game, will bring up the UI, and then unpausing the game or loading a map will bring up the game inputs. It works and I can still use the same inputs across devices, which makes things simple to port. We've looked at the start menu in the game. Here's the start menu in the Godot Engine Editor. You can see there is a few different layers with the credits and the stage itself and the UI going on. Looking at the code here for the start menu, we can see it extends from menu.gd, same as our pause menu, options menu, and key remap menu. This one has a lot going on in its own regard. Like this function set up slots, which populates the save slots with our data and images. The menu select one is a bit bigger than the other functions as well. And we have the switch menu function, which makes the start menu a bit unique, is there's actually like all these different menu layers. It gets kind of fucking insane. Main quit, slot, open, erase. These are all different menus that can be switched between using the start menu. You can see all the code here. It basically picks from a few different options. It's a bit hacky at the moment, although it works, so I've kept it that way. And if it's changing from one sub menu to another, a certain action occurs. For example, opening a save file will change the palette of the player to match the save file and going back we'll pick a default generated palette. No matter which of these different menus is selected, the menu select function will see the string value and pick one of those actions. So you could technically have two of these menus, both have the play function. And that brings me to save slots, a new addition in this update that I believe improves usability a lot. You can now share the game with your friends on the same device. You don't have to feel like deleting your progress if you want someone else to experience the game for the first time. Of course, when it comes to the leaderboards and you're picking your name, you could always try to have three different high scores. <laughs> I'm all across three characters. And that's what I've been up to for four months. I'm really happy to release this update. Hopefully I'll have a new project in the works soon. Something 3D possibly. I really want to work on Godot Engine 4.x branch and do more with that. I've been doing so much on the 3x branch, updating Tiny Crate and working on Rota. And I really want to see how the API has changed, how the interface has changed, and the ease of use. Everything looks so much more fun in 4.0, so hopefully I can get on that branch and get it moving soon. Let me know what you guys thought of this video in the comments, and please feel free to join the Discord server and share your favorite strategies on all the speedrunning tactics or whatever feedback you have about the game. Any ideas for Rota or other future projects I'm working on, please feel free to collaborate, talk about Godot Engine, whatever you want to do. Thanks for sticking around, guys, and I'll catch y'all soon.